Mr. Green. We're going to go ahead and start the last session of the day. Appreciate everybody for sticking around. Uh, we started to touch on some of the aspects of this topic in, in the last uh, session in terms of the implementation and evaluation process for experimental runs, parallel runs, and the model upgrade process. And Hendrick is going to go ahead and start uh, talking about uh, revising the implementation process. Then we will have some panelists come up in front, and we will have a discussion with them. Hey, thank you. <coughs> I'm glad I got a chance to talk now. So uh, I'm going to be, it's going to be relatively short and uh, hitting on a few things basically to set the stage for discussion. A little bit of background. Uh, for those of you who don't know the old way of doing business, uh, we are looking forward because we've actually been working with, uh, uh, Louis asked the question why uh, only 13% of the plant implementations went in in quarter four. And so that started the whole discussion about uh, uh, what's wrong with the implementation process. So we've already started on, uh, on thinking about uh, what uh, what to do and how to go forward. And <coughs> that is stuff that in some ways is already somewhat cast in stone because it has already been briefed up to Louis. But uh, this is one of those other things that I really want to make sure that I get as much feedback on as possible. So uh, this is sort of old <laughs> the old way of doing business. We would have our sort of systematic internal uh, uh, way of, uh, of testing things. The, the little uh, thing behind it is from uh, from uh, from Worf, uh, H. Worf. We would have a whole bunch of different experiments we're running side by side, and go on and on and on. And then once we were done with that, uh, we uh, thought we had something that was ready for implementation, uh, including having done retrospective work and everything. The next step in the process was to go through a CCB at the EMC, uh, see if the uh, scientific, check the scientific integrity, the product quality, and uh, if that looked good, then I, as the EMC director, would sign off on going forward with that implementation. Then we generated the uh, RFCs and submit them to uh, NCO. RFCs are the, uh, is our paperwork to get something to, into operations. Then we get into the implementation phase. Uh, the, the production analysts at NCO build the parallels. We do a 30-day parallel test. Uh, the test is done for uh, uh, to, uh, test the code stability and the data flow. Uh, then uh, those products go to the centers, uh, the code developers, and uh, and any kind of other evaluators that we want to have. Uh, and then at the end of those 30 days, the assessment from those 30 days goes to the NCEP of the director, so to Bill, and then. Uh, uh, the NCEP centers uh, all get uh, uh, their voice towards Bill, and then Bill uh, signs off on going operational. And then you get the implementation. So what's the problem with this? <laughs> the problem of this is, uh, well, just listen to our stakeholders. Uh, the requirement, uh, of course, was an issue. Uh, how do we get here? Why do we do all this? Well, that was typically sort of an internal uh, uh, so, some were external, some were much more internal. Uh, so uh, the real issue is uh, stakeholders didn't know what kind of changes were being made because where are stakeholders involved? Somewhere over here. By the time we are already ready for doing a 30-day parallel. So um, that 30-day parallel is typically way too short for any of our customers to be able to, uh, to uh, do something with it. And this is something that we've been hearing basically since about a year ago when we did the stakeholders meeting for the NCEP strategic plan uh, development this over a year ago already. So how could you go uh, further with that? So uh, how could you go further with that? <laughs> well, we, we talked about that quite a bit just in, in terms of uh, so what is happening here? Why do we have missing implementations not working as well? So what what do we need to do? First of all, we need to be much more diligent about how we start the process. So instead of uh, having um, uh, the scientists at either uh, uh, ESRL or uh, MDL or uh, at EMC uh, just uh, sort of uh, decide what their uh, new favorite uh, project is going to be, we really need to get everybody uh, involved with that. So uh, 
ideally you would conduct some kind of workshop, either a really formal one, depending on how big your system is, uh, and get information back uh, from your users about what you should prioritize in terms of what you are going to target for improvement. Uh, you, you need to uh, be able to uh, uh, have some kind of idea of how much you will improve it. Uh, you have to figure out how much it will cost uh, in terms of uh, do I need to bring on uh, some external researchers? Or do I need to uh, buy compute time somewhere? Uh, what does it cost in, in the quote-unquote readily available uh, compute time? Uh, a big issue, when the GFS 13 kilometer came out, I had four petabytes of retrospective data sitting on tape and no way to give it to anybody for evaluation. That was my biggest frustration last year. So one of the things we've really been trying to improve, and thank you, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think Becky is a superwoman too. Thank you, Becky, for helping out, helping out with, uh, with uh, getting uh, the GEFS data, some of the hurricane data, uh, some of the herd data out early and fast, uh, as well as uh, the retrospective data. So we need to develop uh, not just that, uh, we need to figure out how it's going to be disseminated. We need to make sure that we have a real test plan. So on day one, we know what we're going to target, uh, how we, uh, what we expect, how we're going to test it. So it makes life a lot easier for everybody to uh, give a thumbs up or a thumb down. Uh, we need to get end-to-end uh, -end planning done. And we really need to get some kind of approval at this level already instead of just doing that internally. And that's not just an EMC internal thing. Uh, uh, that's the same thing with MDL. That's the same thing with, uh, with uh, 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 places like ESRL. And uh, same thing with NOS. And some of these organizations actually have a, a very good uh, system in place. I mean, I'm, I've had the pleasure of interacting with NOS for many years. And they have a fairly formalized, uh, uh, staged uh, uh, process for doing this. So after all this is done, after we have a plan, then we start the real work. And you can talk a little bit about how many of these uh, steps you want to do. The idea is that you execute some kind of test plan, and then uh, uh, you, you, set, you set clear expectations of what you're doing. You create clear data. And then uh, you, you take a two-week or so period for pre-designed people to look at that. Uh, who should do that? Well, if you were at the SUDO conference, Louis really wants to get the SUS and the DOS much more involved and uh, really wants a significant part of their time to be part of, uh, of our implementation process by evaluating. And uh, then this goes uh, on and on and on uh, until we get a final approval for implementation. And only then we hand off our data to NCO. So now the NCO side of, uh, of the uh, implementation is going to become a lot more predictable and a lot more manageable. Uh, because we already have uh, approval and we have a very clear path of how to go forward. Other way of looking at that, oh, and by the way, it's not just the SUS and the DOS, uh, as we report this out to Louis, the remark was made very clear that uh, the MAG is going to play a significant role in this too. Other way of looking at that is a timeline. So in terms of a decision point or a gates, uh, you have a planning workshop to begin with, and you spend quite a bit of time on science testing in parts. And by the way, a lot of this is based on uh, how uh, VJ used to be running the H4 on a very fixed schedule. Then you select which upgrades look, uh, look promising. And with these upgrades, you exercise the test plan. So you do all the retrospective work you need. In some cases, it's just straightforward retrospective work. In some cases, that may be uh, uh, already some of the reforecast and reanalysis. Then you have a very short period of science evaluation, and at that point, you decide whether to implement or not. Now, a system like the GFS does not live in a vacuum. There's a lot of downstream users. For instance, uh, uh, Mike's group uh, having to get uh, the MOS adjusted. So normally, in the implementation process, there is a piece of time included what, uh, in which uh, our downstream users of the main code will be able to see whether they need to make any adjustment and go forward with that. And then once all that is done and we're ready for it, the whole package is handed off to NCO, then you have a 30-day IT test and you have the implementation. The fun part of doing this is that if you uh, put this uh, together this way, you can actually work on a, um, on a continuous development process 
uh, and which is becoming an overlapping process because at this moment, when I've started to select upgrades for this implementation that may be, may be uh, suitable, oh, sorry, other thing first. So one of the things that is really important here is the fact that we do not do this in a vacuum. So all the way up to doing the science testing of bits and pieces, it really should be a, um, a, uh, a collaborative work between operations and their partners. So anywhere here and possibly way farther back, we should be working with our, with our partners. And so if you think of Louis Funnel, I didn't copy that. Uh, this is really getting the bottom part, the, uh, the, R, the, the T2O part, uh, above here, you're living a little bit higher in the funnel. And so by the time you select what your upgrades is, you can start actually the, the planning workshop for your next implementation. And you can actually have an overlap with doing all the, all the development work while you're finishing up the implementation that you're doing before. And all these, these lengths are, of course, a little bit uh, completely uh, uh, unscaled. But this is going back to what Suda was showing earlier. It will take us approximately six or seven years uh, to get a new CFS in place. But once we do this process and it becomes a continuous process, a significant part of that, of that uh, process is overlapping. And uh, for instance, uh, this part will be only four years and that part will be the other three years. But that means that, that although you have a seven year process, you may actually have a four year up update cycle. So, and there's some food for thought here. Uh, one of the reasons why we want to do this, and we want to have predictability in our implementation process. Predictability in our implementation process means uh, one of the things that could mean is to have a fixed upgrade schedule. So one of the things we would like to do, uh, we already do it with h -Warf. The h -Warf goes in uh, uh, a week or two, in ideally before the start of the hurricane season. It tends to be a week or two behind, but we are very, very, very close to that. So eventually, we would like to be able to, for instance, uh, update the GFS uh, every year in January. And uh, if we have that kind of a schedule, and if you bring that back to all these decision points and bits and pieces, it becomes much more predictable for our downstream users what's going on, too. But it has another impact, too. One of the reasons why we had a lot of uh, a very few operational implementations in the fourth quarter and a lot of these things shifted out is because of the fact that we had one or two big implementations being delayed, and that meant there were being delayed, and that meant not having resources for other implementations that we had scanned. So it becomes a, uh, a domino effect. If you want to do this as a real project-based uh, uh, management system, you may come to this conclusion here, that, uh, uh, or this point here, or this point here, you may come to the conclusion that nothing is available at that moment to go into implementation that year. And what do you do then? You skip and you go to the next slot. Along the same line, one of the big issues that we've had this year with uh, uh, missing deadlines is because both internally and externally, there have been a few people who promised us code at a certain day, and six months later, we still didn't have code. So this is going to be a very different way of doing business. We don't have anything to implement, then we're not waiting and delaying. No, we're skipping and we're going to the next year. That's something that people will have to get used to. Dealing with the downstream side is food for thought. What do you do? At this point, you're ready to implement this model, but you need time to get the downstream guys going. Are we going to implement and run things in parallel for a while to get as fast as possible new model in? Or are we going to wait for the implementation until every other model is ready and we have the simplest model suite of every time? I don't know the answer to that, but especially with the, the GEFS, as we have the discussions with the water center, the size of this piece to do the, to do the uh, either the downstream adjustments or uh, is so big that's the order of a year. So we're actually thinking uh, about, uh, uh, about whether or not we should uh, go to a business model where we have a sunset day for the old model that is not the same as the implementation day for the new version of the model. And then the whole idea of how you do uh, reforecast and reanalysis uh, is, is a point. If you do the reforecast and reanalysis for, um, uh, for uh, uh, calibration, 
Uh, we mostly agree within the Weather Service that it requires a relatively lean reanalysis, which I'm very much willing to take out of height uh, in the sense of uh, the compute resources. If you want to do a reforecast that is big enough to do validation and decision support, these reanalysis at this moment look much, much bigger than the compute effort uh, or on the actual operational side. That is something we have to design. So, the past, uh, we already did some of this with H4, especially the fixed scheduling and the stringent project management. And for instance, the last draft, people sort of forgot that, but we actually did a, a, a we used a community workshop to decide that we were not going to go with higher resolution, that we would go with more members, and that we would retire one of the, one of the cores. So it's not completely new, it's just a question of uh, starting to do this systematically. The present, for the GFS that's coming up uh, next summer, we will make an implementation decision in middle or late February, uh, two or three weeks after we've done all the retrospectives. We've been starting to advertise that. So what we really want to do, all our, all our evaluators to do, is to go through and to, uh, to make sure that they have access to the retrospectives that become available and are able to decide whether they uh, want to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down based on the three or so year retrospective and not on the mon one month uh, parallel run. Uh, and along that same line, we will start the real development of GEFS version 12, not until we have uh, really structurally uh, done a user workshop to have the users work with us on seeing what we target for the next implementation. The future is really start with users and with users. Project management per system, which then allows Becky and others to do a much better project management of the entire resources and use that more efficiently. And the stick to your schedule or skip your implementation is going to be interesting to see if we can uh, can enforce that. So, Steve, leave it at that. <coughs> and we're going to invite the panel members up. We have a nice, diverse group representing the regions in the field, NCO, EMC, and the MAG, as well as uh, Hendrik himself will be up there. And what we're going to do is have each of our panel members provide us with three or four minutes or so of their perspective, their view on uh, how the model process, evaluation process uh, can be made to work better and to serve the needs uh, both of the field forecasters, which as you saw in Hendrick's uh, slides, we're trying to bring in through the uh, STI uh, MEG team, uh, and also, uh, certainly, a lot of heavy lifting on Becky's part as well as EMC to get these set up. So what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, first with the field representatives, and we're going to uh, do it, I think, according, I think Yogi said, alpha, line up alphabetically according to height, and that will allow Jeff Craven, uh, who's the Central Region SSD uh, chief, to uh, start first. And give us your view in terms of where the evaluation process has been at, at, in central region offices and how you might envision uh, perhaps this framework that Hendrik uh, presented uh, serving your needs. Well, <clears throat> um, in getting the feedback over the last year or so, uh, there, there's a definitely a desire uh, from the SUS that like to give input on NWP to have more time. So although they appreciated the efforts to look at parallel runs and uh, operational runs for roughly a month or so, one, uh, some issues that came up are was the interesting weather event come up during that period? Did they have time to look at it in other words, a common theme is, well, if I have a big snowstorm or a severe weather event, then I'm busy forecasting it, and I not necessarily have the time to evaluate. So something, uh, something that happened with the SREF evaluation recently was, I think, was very enlightening. Uh, the 
the bulk statistics on that suggested that there wasn't a particularly big difference between the parallel and the operational. And there was a brief delay, I, I believe, in, in implementing. And when we looked, at, we, several SUs in Central Region uh, and others outside of Central Region requested some specific gate that they thought would be interesting to see the operational and the parallel runs. And collectively, as we looked through what seemed to be about 10 to 12 different cases from across the country, even though the bulk overall statistics were fairly similar between the runs, the parallel definitely, almost every occasion, offered a better forecast uh, for these high impact events than than the operational. And so from our perspective and what we'd like to try going forward, and it's already actually in motion with the GFS, uh, this next upgrade is we, w we went out to Central Region SUS and this actually went out to other regions and said, give me a couple of cases for a flood event, a snow event, severe weather that you would like to see run and we'll run, uh, uh, EMC will provide the operational and the parallel runs for you to compare on an event that probably was challenging, may have been, maybe have a better forecast and see how it did. Uh, and I think that would, that would get us involved, would give us a couple, three weeks to study an event and uh, would allow us uh, to, to, on something that we know is a high impact event, to evaluate how the new uh, model would uh, perform. So uh, going forward, the way that we're, we're hoping to do these, um, these because the SU, we want the SUs involved in these evaluations, and it's something that came out of the SUDO uh, National Conference, is probably we're going to have three projects. Uh, two of them will involve one, a global MEG group, which will have the MEG presence plus hopefully a SU or a uh, STI type from one of the NSEP centers on the team to help evaluate and or at least facilitate some of these and also one for the convective allowing uh, ensembles that we'll be looking at. So that's, that's, our, that's this perspective that I see is that if we have a longer time period and we have targeted high impact events to study, uh, we should do a better job of scientifically giving a a thumbs up or down on how things are proceeding. Okay, thanks, Jeff. We're going to go over to Andy Edmond from Western Region next. Yeah, thank you. I don't have much more to add. I, I think, first off, I like what you're proposing. I think that's a, a much better approach. This idea of allowing us to look at some specific cases, the ones that are tough, the high impact events, we've I know in Western Region we've identified four. I, I think those are really good cases. And I also want to give a shout out to the National Centers. I do appreciate the detailed sort of work that they do uh, you know, with the guests. SBC pointing out the, you know, the level of instability in a hurricane center with the hurricane tracks. I think collectively through those three distinct and different efforts, I think we can get, get, you, get you guys some pretty good feedback. So I like some of the, some of the steps we're taking here. Andy, we will have time, obviously, when they're all finished with their introductory remarks to have questions and discussion going on. It's fitting that Becky is seated between Jeff and Andy, um, symbolic of the role NCO plays in serving the, uh, the forecasting community and others. So, Becky, if you'll chime in, please. Okay. Um, I feel like I'm going to be a bit of a naysayer, but I don't mean it that way. I just want to put some of the technical things out there. Um, you know, in thinking about this, on, the first, on one hand, I'm really excited that I won't touch code till you all have decided this is somewhere we want to go. That's a fantastic change. Um, the things we're going to have to think about, these evaluations will be run by developers. And the issues there are going to be one of, the, one of the great things when I went from MDL as a developer to NCO is I get to use the computer all the time now. 
Developers don't have that. So we're going to see disruptions in these parallels. They won't be able to run every day necessarily. So that will be a difference that we just have to get used to. Um, changes in the model as, they're, as you're evaluating it. We'll have to um, keep close tabs on that. What might have been tweaked? What might have been changed? Um, how do we get to the data? That is one of the big things. And what data do you want? Um, you know, we're running the, the guess. We did the retrospective and we put two years of data out on the FTP server. And I don't know that too many people came and got it. But part of me wonders, how many of you out there are going to come and get every day for two years? It sounds like we want to go more of the targeted cases. But then we've got CPC or the water center who need all the data to do evaluations. Maybe that data is stored internally. Externally, we put certain targeted data. So that's something we have to think about. Um, we've talked a lot, whether it's NCO doing the 30-day or the development organizations, how do we best get it to you? We need to tackle the AWIPS issue. And how can we get some of these products into AWIPS so you can see them on the forecast floor? Um, we're working with the MAG. Uh, Andy out in Western Region, one of his, his folks, has helped us put up a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, Nomads is a possibility, and of course the mag that we've talked about. Um, ability of evaluators to evaluate. You know, we stacked up, I think, six evaluations on you guys um, about four months ago. And some of it is you physically can't evaluate them all. Some of it is some folks aren't interested in certain models. Um, so we need to look at that. We need to schedule these things in such a way that you guys in the field can participate optimally. Um, also, what level of change is going to trigger this? Uh, process is not up there anymore. You know, there's some things we do that are more maintenance and upkeep. There are some things that are major changes. We'll have to have some level of this triggers it and this doesn't. Um, so then the last thing I have is what does my 30-day become? And I will have a couple things that I'll still need from folks. Um, one thing is we're the last check on compute resources. Um, developers have to do, developers get really creative to get their niche and be able to run. So they don't necessarily run it the way we'll run it. And our we may come out with a lot more resources to hold delivery time. So that's something that will have to be vetted at that last month in the run-up. So we might have to do some changes there. Um, IT stability, of course, but that I don't see as an issue. Um, run it. Hope it doesn't crash. Fix it if it does. And then output validation. Because what you get to evaluate may not be the same thing that the National Weather Service puts out operationally. So I need to make sure the private sector folks and you in the centers and the WFOs that we don't put out grib that's garbled and crash a with on day one. So I'm still going to need certain folks to agree during that 30 days to pull down the data and make sure we didn't screw it up. Um, so we still will need some input uh, for the 30 day. But again, it will be more of a technical, what kind of files did I make for you and are they right? Um, those are basically the notes that I have. I mean, NCO is going to move into a role more of facilitating. Um, providing the plumbing, providing the disk space, helping to make this as stable as possible. Um, but a lot of what you're used to us doing, um, Stephen Earle is the SPA team lead, me sending out those emails and those memos, that is going to move upstream to the developers. So um, those are some of the challenges I see. But like I said, I think it's exciting. I think I had to go to CAFTI once. And a certain someone in an alley that wanted me in an alley earlier today ripped me apart in Kathy because I drew my line in Western Region like that instead of like that. So I do remember Kathy. But <laughs> that seeing that kind of thing come back where we're looking at science ahead of time, I'm all for it. So who's next? Thanks, Becky. That's very good. Uh, especially the fact that you, you not only have to serve folks inside the Weather Service, but the external community as well and setting up some of the data flows for evaluation. Let's go to Jeff Manikin. Jeff wears two hats as a model developer, a code passer offered to NCO, and he plays a big role in the MEG as well, which will uh, be playing more of a role in the model evaluation process based on 
uh, Hendricks, Hendricks Roadmap. Yes. Thanks, uh, Steve. I'm representing the model evaluation group uh, today, uh, my colleague Glenn White and uh, Corey Gruschini. And, yeah, sorry, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to uh, say that, uh, that based on Meg work in the last year, there are aspects of the uh, current GFS package and the next NAM package uh, that uh, address specific issues that we, uh, that the Meg brought to uh, those branches' uh, attention. Uh, we also played a, a significant role in uh, finding cases to assist uh, with the SHREF uh, evaluation and, and decision to implement. Um, our, our work to, uh, uh, to find issues in the model to, has led to tangible uh, improvements, and uh, we're, we're, we're proud of that work. Uh, but we, we can play a, a larger role uh, in the implementation process, and, and we will. Um, going forward, I, I see our, our role uh, growing to, uh, to really uh, fill the, the uh, kind of bridge the gap. We're, we all agree that the 30 day is, is going to become more of a functional test, and the field is going to be involved in the evaluation sooner. The key is going to be now making the transition from parallel to mature parallel, and, and the MEG will play a big role in that. that we, uh, it, w the parallel will be coming to the field sooner, but it needs to be a mature parallel. It can't be something that's continually evolving. The evaluators have to keep keeping track of all changed again last week. So getting to that stage of when initial parallels are run and changes are made, made the MEG needs to play, uh, and, and will play a bigger role in that. Uh, if you've been uh, listening in on the uh, MEG meetings in recent weeks, uh, Glenn White has done a, an excellent job uh, keeping everyone posted on uh, different versions of the GFS that have been uh, in test mode, uh, things that have been added to the parallel, subtracted, changed, uh, to try and address some of the big issues that were uncovered this past summer. And uh, again, he, he's kept everyone really well uh, up to date with uh, where things stand, and, and it has allowed the parallel to evolve into a mature parallel now that the field is, uh, that is ready to be turned over to the field for evaluation. So uh, th there was mention of these uh, STI teams that the uh, uh, MEG is uh, going to uh, play a, a big role in, uh, that we're going to basically bring in our, that Sioux expertise to, uh, to help us uh, uh, make uh, decisions on what needs to be changed in the models, and, and then help uh, evaluate the uh, candidates for change, and then make sure the final system looks good. Uh, Jeff uh, mentioned the, uh, the GFS, uh, our global team, which is going to hit the ground running uh, in the next uh, few weeks, and there'll be the uh, high-res ensemble team that will uh, play a role, in, in uh, especially via HWT, to help figure out the uh, best way to proceed with the initial high-res implementation. And then the third team is, is going to be super critical. It's the dissemination team. And as Becky touched on, uh, it, it's great to say that we're going to uh, play a bigger role in evaluating and bring everyone into the evaluation process. But getting all that data to the field, getting the retrospective data to the field is, is not a, a simple thing. And, that uh, team is going to be critical to uh, making this all work. Hey, Jeff. Uh, Hendrick, do you have anything? Uh, you haven't had much opportunity to talk today, um, so I, I don't know if you want to throw anything in at this point. Uh, I, I yield my time to the chair. <laughs> all right. So I, I think you've gotten a cross-section of the current status and the ideas of where uh, the evaluation process may move ahead, and as you can readily tell, especially from, from Becky's comments and, and, and Jeff, Jeff's comments, um, getting the data out is not a trivial task in order to have it available for WFO SUs and possibly forecasters to look at. I'm going to start by throwing out one question, if I can, although Andy looks like he wants me to stop. Yeah. Uh, well, we've been talking about the mechanical part of the process. When I look at what is really successful, it's the interaction. So when I go back and I look at some really, you know, 
when you, when you sit there and you go through this stuff and you say, aha, I found and seen something, and you send it in, you want to get some sense of somebody read it and they understand sort of what it is you're talking about. We don't necessarily mean that you have to fix it right now, but that interaction is really critical. And I look back at, if we're going to make this successful with the SUS, they're going to need that interaction. And when I look back at which efforts have been really successful, where's the, where's the RTMA group? I mean, you guys are way cool. You know, my SUS can, can send stuff in, and, and, and you don't, at least if you get mad, you don't show it. You know, because occasionally some of the students can be a little bit abrupt, and, and, and they're not, that's just the way they are. They're not trying to be rough. But that interaction is really valuable. And Stan Benjamin's group, the same thing again over the years, like with the early days of the HER, you know, I, I saw comments, you know, this is working, this is not. So I guess one of the things, and this is a question I guess to the INSEP folks, is how do we get that really critical communications going? It doesn't have to be anything fancy, it doesn't have to even be in English, it's so short, the back and forth, what are you looking at, oh yeah, we're seeing this, oh yeah, this is how this works, whether you realize it or not, when you write back and you explain to us, well, this, the reason this is messed up because of this, you'd be surprised how quickly that goes around the operational workforce, because it helps them understand what's going on. So I guess when we're talking about all this, we've been talking about the mechanics, but to me, the key thing on whether or not this is going to succeed or not is the communications. Good point. It's, it comes down to, well, it's, it, it's extremely technical and scientific from the modeling perspective and the IT, the bandwidth, the communications. Um, it still comes down to having effective people-to-people -people communication. And what I know we have found at SPC is that when we might bring something to someone's attention the first time, it might not resonate totally in terms of, well, why is this important from an operational perspective? So it's something that could allow you to, I think, uh, uh, get a continuing dialogue going uh, to make sure there's, a, there's understanding. Yeah, I guess I have uh, several questions. First off, uh, I want to second what Andy said about the interaction with the field. Uh, and particularly our experiences with the RTMA. Uh, it, it's, it's a big deal uh, when forecasters identify something, report it, and they get a response back and they get an explanation. Uh, that's, that's critical to keeping them involved in the process and keeping them interested. Um, there have been instances in the past that that, that kind of action didn't, reaction didn't occur because they felt they were just making comments and they were falling into a black hole. Uh, so that, that's, that's real important. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about some thoughts as to what would trigger the process that Hendrikus, uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying Hendrikus. We have a Hendrikus in our region. Hendrik, um, what, uh, what would trigger this process? Is there a designated point for the field to go to in order to start this process? Um, how, how would that be uh, addressed? Well, the idea is that we want to do, want to, want to see if we can go to most of our systems on a, on a fixed schedule. So that means that uh, we need to make sure that we advertise that. Uh, did you mean the whole system, or did you mean the mag interactions? Uh, no, no, I'm talking about the, the flow diagram that you had up on your, your slide up there. So we, we would hope to be able to, to get most of our systems on, on a fixed update schedule. So. So it's, a, it's, it's for us to make sure that we advertise uh, when we start with which systems and uh, to make sure that the right people are uh, involved with that. And so, um, <coughs> like I said, the herd has been doing that for a long time already. Uh, we, are, we are trying to figure out uh, with the GEFS if we're going to try and do something in February or whether we're going to do that at uh, the what is it, April scheduled uh, ensemble workshop. And so uh, we are going to, over the next few months, are going to see which of these uh, different models we can plan. For instance, the uh, uh, GFS, because of the delay of the present implementation, we're planning to do the, uh, the 17, is it, we're doing the implementation this, uh, this uh, coming summer, and then it will be another 16 months, and then we'll go on to an, uh, a yearly schedule uh, to, to do effectively January implementations. And 
the GFS and the H4 are the ones that we assess, have set dates for. The other ones we have to start. Uh, to start. And, and what Becky said earlier, um, what's going to trigger it and what not. We want to start big, with the big stones in the jar. We want to start with the big systems. And then as we learn from that, we'll see and figure out how far we go on the smaller level. And, and as Becky uh, very clearly said, uh, uh, this is really the systematic long-term development of the systems. Uh, we do have to have uh, emergency fixes to systems. We do have to, to uh, be able to transition uh, uh, systems to other machines sometimes, all that kind of stuff. That, that, that may not be in this process, but the long-term systematic science development of these systems should be in this way, starting with the big systems and starting with the, with the GFS and GDFS. Uh, a quick question for, uh, probably for, for Jeff. Uh, Jeff Manikin, um, you were talking about the retrospective runs and all the data and the, and the cases and everything. Is the intent to have that data be displayable on AWIPS, or are there going to be other ways to view it, such as the, the model viewer with the blender or, or other techniques like that, so that you're not having to move the data, but there's a way of looking at it? Do, do you have thoughts on that? Ken, I'm, I'm not sure if we know the answer to that yet. Um, we. The, 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 this STI team is, is formed to kind of figure out uh, the answers to, to questions like that. It, I think what we'd like to do, and, and some very initial work has been done to uh, set up a, a lab on the second floor in EMC where, in theory, we can host uh, a lot of retrospective data and bring in uh, visitor Sue's from the field to come for a week and uh, kind of sort through it to with us, to look at the cases that need to be looked at, look at it on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis, uh, and, and hopefully we can make that happen sooner rather than later. Just one other question. It's actually kind of unique. We will actually, for the first time, have AWIP systems at EMC. Hey. <laughs> uh, one other quick question uh, for Becky. In your opening remarks, did I hear you refer to the term CAFTI? Yeah, I'm that old. I wasn't implying you were that old. I just I, I knew I'd get a, I knew Jeff would <laughs> come. On. You, you might want to explain what that is. Oh, I'm sorry. So CAFTI, well, gosh, it it was only around for the first couple years I was here, but it was before we could implement. I were, I used to work for the Moss Group, so before we implemented the big Moss upgrade, we had to go in front of CAFTI, which had a representative from there were regional representatives and then all the headquarters offices and we had to present the science to them and say we'd like to do this yes or no and get their approval before we then turned and handed it to NCO so I think it's very it was very similar to the NTEP director briefing but it was you got votes from all over um, and then I think OSIP tried to take its place I, I Personally, myself, I didn't see as much of the science side with OSIP, but I had a question for you. So if I sent you products in AWIPS, can you see an old day in, M in AWIPS? Okay, so that was one question I had. Like, I know in AWIPS we can send them old GEMPAC files and they can pull them up, but that would be a question of something we'd have to look at on the, the team is, you know, can we technically do that? So. Okay, we have a question right here. We can take this first. I wanted to first make a, a point that um, one of the things that from a you know logistical point of view for the uh, parallels is that there's not a comparable subset type mechanism right now uh, to do that for the parallel data like you would have in Nomads or OpenDAP or something like that, which if that would allow people to you know subset and grab what they wanted. Um, and then I had a question about the this if there had been thoughts about the schedule and the 30-day parallel if something blows up, how far uh, how far after that 30-day parallel have you do you think would be the implementation date? I ask because uh, personally we're in the IDP framework for our website now, which means we need a lot more lead time for deployments. FAA needs even more lead time for uh, changes that they need to make, and I know a lot of other customers have similar issues. So if there is an IT s 
slip is that built into the into the release date so that we don't have to bump that forward if there's something caught in that period. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, what well, your first question or your first point, the um, we actually the last couple upgrades we've been starting to get it into Nomads. Um, it, usually what happens is my team doesn't have enough time before the start of the 30-day, but hopefully partway through the 30-day we've been getting it into Nomad, so that's something we're starting to try to get to. Um, in terms of, you, you know, our, our rule in NCO is if we make a change, we restart and run for 30 days. So anything that became an issue, we would likely then reset the clock 30 days. Um, I would also think, we haven't talked about we haven't laid out any details, but the whole idea of notification and, and TINs and, and public notification, that probably wouldn't be triggered until you got closer to NCO. So I think that I think there would be most pretty much just a 30-day notice um, that, okay, now we're ready to go, which sitting and listening, I was thinking, okay, if we're going through this for like a year or more and going back and forth and back and forth, how do people know? Okay, now we're going to go. So that that's something we definitely have to look at. Oh, and e even if we don't know exactly the answer to your question, um, the one thing that doesn't change very much is that in the old process, you do the 30-day parallel, and we typically try to get on Bill's calendar as soon as we can after the 30-day is done, and then the next Tuesday you do the implementation. And so so that that piece of the schedule is not changing very much. So if we do the same things, then, then, then that will not see much changes for you in terms of notification lead time there. I want to circle back to the data <coughs> access question. There, there's no solution for today and tomorrow, but there's stuff coming over the horizon that I think is going to help us. Uh, one is AWIP's data delivery. It allows you to basically point at a server, in this case Nomads, and pull in the subset of data that you want. Now the regions have just recently got the full load of that. So we have, I don't know, maybe you guys have tested it. We haven't tested it yet. Um, but when I go back, that's one of the things we plan to do. And then on top of that, Ken Johnson is leading an effort. Right now we have a problem. The students have a problem with their WESIS because they have to do all the local archiving. And they basically have said, this is a mess. And basically there's a plan <clears throat> to develop a next generation WESIS. It's basically on the cloud. And now if we do it right, we'd open up the door for this sort of stuff too. So again, not a solution for today or tomorrow, but there's some things happening where we can make this better maybe a year from now. I'd like to talk about communication. Um, what I think Jeff and I had in mind for the global group was to establish an ongoing group that would go on with members changing the time. And for the global group, uh, what we suggested was that we asked each of the service centers and sub-service centers if they wanted to have a member of the group and asked each of the regions if they wanted a member of the group. And the regions we would accept. I know. If we didn't get people from the groups we thought of was appropriate, we might then go back to them. And this group would meet once a week by teleconference and more frequent emails to communicate to first develop the processes we're talking about, and then just to follow through on communication. And I would hope from the service centers and from the regions, they would say, oh, this Sue has done great work out in Podunk, Iowa. You should address MEC. And I would like to see more presentations from the field at MEC. Why am I trying to present synoptic meteorology to forecasters? I have no idea. I'm not a synoptician. Um, and so this would be one form of communication. The dissemination group, one of its tasks is to look at how do we set up a forum. And, you know, I think uh, VLAB seems to be the magic word we're hearing. So the idea would be we set up a forum on VLAB and you would submit, you know, forecasters could submit what they've seen on the global model's performance. And, you know, it would be kept track of. And, you know, we would try to respond and say we're addressing this or we have this thought, or that's a good question. We have no, go, what's go, no idea what's going on. Um, so that is what I envision for communication. Now, for this one, I would use the, um, two words. 
be patient with us on this implementation. We're trying to use the new implementation process for the GFS before we have defined the new de implementation process. Um, so I would say be patient but persistent. And one of the weak links, and it's going to be me, because as my understanding, I'm supposed to plot the case studies for the field. Um, I don't know how that's going to go. Okay, but anyway, that's what I have in mind. Mike, you have someone from that side? Okay, well, so I'm going to go a little bit in the other direction with Becky. Now that the 30-day is only a tech test, does it still need to be 30 days? I don't know, I've only been around a couple of years, I don't know a lot about some of the technical back end stuff that needs to happen. So now that it's IT only, does it need to be 30 days? Well, sometimes no, um, but one of the things we also have to do is fit into the NWS directive on notification. And that says for most of the changes we make to the models, if you make a change to products, if you make a change to the sci underlying science, you have to give 30 days notification. So I would argue if, we, if we're waiting, if we, if we have to give the 30-day notification, we may as well take advantage of that, run it, check the stability, and provide the data, sample data to the customers for as long as we can. So I think typically you will see it. We do do for smaller changes, um, you know, depending on how often, like the HER, we can check that out a lot faster because it runs 24 times a day. Um, some of the ones that only run once a day, we only get one shot a day. So we might adjust it based on the level of changes and how much impact there are to customers. And the other thing is just a comment. I think we all, the developers, the, the, the forecasters, everybody needs to get used to the idea that model changes are going to have to be determined much more ahead of time than they have been in the past. If we're going to get this set and get proper valuation periods, the code needs to be, at least for the most part, needs to be frozen six, eight, ten months in advance. So we're not going to be able to address something and have it fixed in a release in four, four months from now. Uh -oh. so, so this is all new. And this process, and again, it's not completed, but it's designed to facilitate communication with the customers a lot earlier in the process. And one could argue, to, to your point, that, all right, so the GEFS went in last week. All right, I'll guarantee it, they're already figuring out what the next one's gonna look like. And they need to involve the community to help identify what the priorities are for the metrics for success for the next upgrade of the GEFS. The water center should be there, the field should be there, the national center should be involved in it too. Maybe we should go for more membership in the next implementation, not worry about resolution. But we need to have these conversations and early on in the process, not, you know, when this thing is pretty well baked and the retros are running and, you know, things are already done. So that's one point. I think Hendrick alluded to that. And this, this issue of getting data sets out to people, it's not, I think the most value is not going to be so much in the real-time parallels, but the retrospective runs. The EMC does a lot of work with the retrospectives, years of, of retrospectives sitting there in the can. And we've got to find a way to be creative to get people access to the information that they want to see, whether it's high-impact events. And again, a high-impact event for one, one community is not going to be the same for another community. So, and that's kind of what the MEG is all about. And Ming-Gi is, is dedicated, committed to building infrastructure. And so talking about infrastructure, you know, we're a billion-dollar agency, the weather service alone, right? And so I'm sure that if this is a high priority for the weather service, and I think it is based on the pseudo workshop that we had here back in September, the UMAC meeting that we had and others, we got to find a way to work together and, and put some resources towards building that infrastructure that is going to help us realize all the investments, the hundreds of millions of dollars of investments we're making into modeling. So to me, it's a, it's a very positive and a great opportunity to improve communication between the modelers and the field and the stakeholders outside and get really smart with our IT and get these data sets out to people that need to see them. And I look at Mike, you know, uh, Mike with MDL. You know, he did a lot of great stuff with the National Blend of Models, the viewers. There's a lot of technologies that we just need to sit down and think about. It's not all up to EMC. So I think if we put our collective heads together and identify what it is we want this thing to do, I'll guarantee you we'll come up with solutions and the weather service leadership will fund them to get it done. So 
you know, we're used to, you know, we, we solve problems and it's like, you know, we tend to say, no, we can't do that because that's, the, that's our nature. But we have to turn it around upside down and, and say, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. So I just want to encourage everybody to think that way. I'd like to, I'd like to circle back first on uh, a couple of things. Um, Jeff Craven here. We, uh, yeah, I, I don't want us to get, I'm all about short-term wins. So, you know, Andy's talking about how we might be able to improve things down the line. I really, there, there's some examples of things that we, we can leverage in the short term. Um, examples are the, the uh, Great Lakes wave modeling. There's been lots of good interaction between the Sioux and the Great Lakes and uh, Enrique Alves and others that a lot of it's just the communication perspective where a few images are shown back and forth uh, about, and, and that has been enlightening. That what, what happened with the SREF, the last upgrade, is a few images were shared between the SREF developers and some SUS. So I think there's baby steps where there's a drinking game for baby steps. But anyways, uh, haven't, we haven't had very many shots from it yet. But uh, the, there's ways to do short-term wins with very simplistic things. And again, the, 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 the MDL viewer, does it have to always be an AWIP? See, again, we, I think there's ways that we can get com for the, the SUs that want to dissect every, uh, the details of every member of the SREF, they're out there. But in the short term, I think we can, we can have the communication and do it in a very short periods of time where instead of shipping us a bunch of data, a few images are exchanged. So I just want to make sure we, we don't miss that opportunity as well. So I just wanted to hit Bill's point about the reforecast a little harder. And it's going to be necessary for everybody, all the stakeholders, to look at the reforecasts to make sure the model is improved in every season for every cycle. So. If I was talking more of the, I gotta make sure I get it right, retrospectives, not the reforecasts. That's a different beast. Um, Arun had a question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I saw him, and then we can go to you. Oh, you've been waiting? Okay, yeah. So just a couple of uh, two different points. Uh, when Hendrick first started, he uh, laid out uh, lots of different things for this particular new process, and one of them was a regular predictable schedule, uh, and that if you miss your gate, you have to take a lap and get it on the next, the next one, um, which could be a year away. So I, I just have to ask from not only from the implementation side for you, Hendrick and Becky, but also from the field perspective for uh, you guys, for Andy and, and Jeff there. Is that really realistic? I mean, uh, the I can see maybe for some small lower priority things you might be able to get away with that, but you know, the these major model upgrades represent a huge investment in time and effort and money and, uh, and a big payoff. And to, if you miss it by a month, are you really going to wait another 11 months or are we going to do, are we really going to do this? And that's my first question. Well, we've, we've done it with the H-Worf. The uh, H-Worf is not that small a system either. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, I realize that you have to be somewhat careful how you do this, but uh, um, Telling people that we're going to be a little bit more tight with the time schedule does not get the message across. And yeah. So, and so, and so, uh, the reality is that uh, that the domino effect really killed us this year, and at the end of the year, as part one of the things, and we need to get away from that. We need no, uh, even with the H four, uh, we slip we slip a month every now and then. That does happen too, but the reality has to be that you have to have a real you have to have a, a somewhat predictable schedule. We have a few models this year that we didn't implement because six months after the promised date, there was still no code in our hands or in the hands of NCO. Yeah, I think, I mean, there are a lot of 
really, really valid reasons that developers miss their code delivery dates. There are a lot of code delivery dates that are so unrealistic. They were just picked when you'd like it to happen. But I guarantee you, two or three people, when if instead of me saying, okay, we'll take it now, I say, no. It, so the first couple, it'll hurt, but then it'll, it won't happen as often, and then there'll be the exceptions, not the rule. We have another question here. Yeah, yeah one, one quick. Uh, the, the second one was very different. Becky, you started talking at the very beginning, and you mentioned that, uh, that we really can't look at every single upgrade the same way. Um, even if we do tap into all 22 SUs in the field, or, we are, or it doesn't matter. There's a bandwidth issue here that we can't get past. So uh, Bill and I have been talking a little bit about, you know, and Ben as well, as some implementations are more equal than others. And some you expect to see a lot more meteorological significant change than the last one. And I was calling one the little minor tweaks, fixing bugs as a maintenance upgrade. Do we really, how, are we, how is this fit in your, into your new draft process in terms of the field review? Are there some that we can just look at and, and say that we can do those internally, we can ship out the briefings, and people say, yeah, it looks fine, versus other ones which require a much, much bigger review? Well, we, we, already make that, we already make that distinction. I mean, if a satellite goes back, a satellite channel goes back bad, then we switch it off the next cycle. We don't, we don't uh, go back and forth and through, uh, through an... Uh, uh, a, a big review process if it's obvious that there is bad data going in, for instance. Uh, uh, if we get uh, new data points and uh, blacklists and stuff like that, they should, uh, all these kind of things need to be done on a, on a when-needed basis to begin with. If, uh, if there's an IT issue, if there's a compiler issue, all these things is kind of obvious. So, but but you, have to, you have to realize we already live in a very uh, unequal way, that way, un unequal uh, environment that way. And this process is not intended to make a one-size-fits-all thing. It's a first and foremost intended to get control over the big implementations, and we'll see how far we're going to take it and what, what needs to be done or not. Okay. Uh, okay, a um, couple of questions or points. The perspectives are important. It's a lot of data, and uh, we don't have an easy way of transferring that. Uh, we, we we put it up in websites so that people can download it, and now we're getting wrapped on because that's a security flaw that you can't have an open directory on a website that that you can just transfer the data there to. So, what's an easy way to provide perspectives, the full data set, to the community? Now, uh, there is a point being made for the Great Lakes, and it's a great point that uh, Enrique has been very good at providing information and sharing slides uh, with, but that's a that was a dedicated small group that he would ping, and they would respond immediately. It was amazing to see that. It's harder to do that when there's a whole community of outside users who want to look at this. So maybe the MEG, which is used for uh, looking at operational, some MEG cycles can be used for evaluating parallel groups. I mean, I don't know, parallel runs, because the MEG is where everybody seems to show up on a weekly basis. Is that a solution that can be looked at some of this stuff? How do we evaluate this other than just what we have at EMC CCP, where we send out a uh, we send out people to come in, but very because people are busy, they don't dial in for those meetings or those presentations. Well, I um, I, I think that the Meg is already uh, playing that role, uh, not maybe for enough models, certainly not enough for the uh, ocean model. So. I'll up Hendrick, a question to Hendrick. Can we get more people on the MEG? Uh. As, as I said, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, other groups uh, do it as a part of their, uh, their uh, uh, normal set of work. So yeah, you can get a part of your own. Uh, just one, one more piece there. Besides the uh, MEG meetings uh, being used to help uh, uh, show and evaluate some of these parallels. Uh, again, these STI teams, I, I think, are, are really going to help. And, and uh, again, there's only two right now, these pilot test programs to see how they work. They can do a lot of the day-to-day -day 
evaluations perhaps and we can't send large data sets to everyone. And hopefully if these two uh, specific model teams are, are effective, uh, that program will expand to more implementations down the line. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention uh, that you know, evaluating and having as many people evaluate the model I think is a good thing. Uh, at some point there's kind of a, a law of diminishing returns. You know, we have lots and lots of people looking at lots and lots of data. Um, you know, as a forecaster who looks at this as much as he can, there's no way I can evaluate model changes and bulk statistics better than EMC does. You know, and I feel like when I'm looking at evaluating these models, I actually don't see, you know, the European, for instance, uses a scorecard, rather detailed scorecard of significant changes expected improvement. We haven't seen that math. We occasionally see the die-off curve. Um, so my question is, what other types of information from a, a bulk statistic standpoint can uh, EMC provide to the centers in the field you know, to help them with the decision-making process? Well, I, I step out for 30 seconds, so I hope I heard your entire question. But we are making scorecards, and we're moving to those things, because uh, that's one of the problems. Uh, uh, there's so much that we look at, and there's so many bits and pieces that we look at, that uh, when we find two or three parameters that are not uh, behaving as well as we, we like to, if you don't do that in a scorecard, you forget the perspective like crazy. It's like, oh, these three things are going wrong. I just forgot that the other 60 things are actually going right. So, so we are looking at, uh, at uh, a much more systematic way of validating our systems, doing that more centrally. Uh, scorecards is part of that. Part of that is uh, as part of the uh, uh, support for the MEG, we are setting up uh, a Met and Met viewer as uh, interactive ways of, uh, of uh, outsiders to be able to go to our validation database and pull up whatever they want to do. And um, that is part partially in order to be able to have uh, you guys be as efficient as possible as uh, in terms of helping us out with evaluations. It's partially to unify the way we're doing business, and it's partially to, uh, to, uh, to make sure that we have uh, as complete as possible a way of doing business. And as part of the whole, that whole process, we also want to, uh, to be very actively involved with the MED development to be able to add new bits and pieces of validation techniques validation parameters uh, to, uh, to be able to be uh, literally a one-stop shop. I appreciate those efforts. Very hard to find on the EMC webpage. On a realistic point of view, it, it's, it's very difficult to find. I, it, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm surprised that you found something. <laughs> Um, we, we, we are a little delayed with what we're planning to do there, but um, we've been talking with headquarters about websites in general. So the last time that we did an effort to quote unquote unify our websites, the only thing we got back was a template. Uh, what we really need to do with headquarters is to look at what the strategy is for websites to begin with. Because right now we have a hodgepodge of individual websites of individual people and there is no way to manage that properly, and there's no way to build an interface to make it go. So we are committed, and we have a commitment from headquarters to, to do an inventory of all our websites, and instead of trying to improve one or two websites or to, or to build an other overview website or website of websites, we really need to, to, to go to a strategy of what should be done where, what is done at the MAG, should there be a MAG equivalent for all the parallels, what do we do with validation? Where should it be housed? Where sh uh, who should maintain it? How do you deal with um, websites that are really intended to communicate between a small group? And so that is a commitment that uh, I'm making to make sure that by the next production suite review, at the very least, we have a plan to go forward because it, it is, I mean, I think you're an absolute genius if you found something. Thanks. Uh, th three comments. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, I strongly endorse the um, 
proposal to move to a very regular cadence in the model release. Um, I think from the outside community, having a predictable schedule upon which we can plan our activities that revolve around those updates would be tremendously helpful. So I would do that. In fact, I would even go a little bit further, um, and largely from sort of an internal personal anecdote from, from our shop, um, we've moved to a uh, we run a, a version of the HER hourly updating over North America, another one over Europe, and as well as a global model. And we've moved to a very strict, disciplined use of the agile approach from a complete soup to nuts, from the very back end science all the way to the um, uh, regression testing and implementation of model changes. And that occurs on a two week cycle. Every two weeks, we have a small set of upgrades that are going on. And, and there was a pretty big change in our organization from more of the ad hoc, large change approach to these incremental, continuous upgrades. Approach. But in the end, it, it pr provided so much discipline and efficiency and throughput to the organization. It was, it was a easily, uh, uh, in retrospect, a huge improvement in, in the way that we did our model development and implementation. Second point is I heard a couple times it said that during the evaluation, um, the, the evaluations need to check off all of the boxes. And I disagree with that. I think in balance, most of the boxes need to be checked off. And as long as your upgrade in balance is improving the overall system, that upgrade should go in place. It doesn't need, it, you may, if you get 90% of it better and 10% of it worse, I still think that's an upgrade that should happen. And third, a point uh, uh, I need to repeat again uh, that I said earlier uh, this afternoon, I think. Um, in all of this discussion, during all of this evaluation process, I never once heard outside of NWS stakeholders being involved in the process despite their critical importance in delivering weather services to the nation. You've got to get the private community and academic involved in that process deeply, not just as a checkbox as sort of an afterthought, but deeply involved in these processes, and we don't have that today. Maybe following into that same point, didn't plan to pile on, but uh, we do have this process in SREL about the model development, which we do, uh, demonstration, parallel experimental runs, that we get an enormous amount of feedback on that. So what happens in that is that we actually do major upgrades to our version probably about two times a year. We will do small changes like what you're talking about on a more frequent basis, and I think, Mike, that's what you were asking Becky about a way to accelerate that. But what happens out of that is that we have, you know, there's some cost in uh, being able to make sure these runs stay going. But, but what takes place is that a year ahead of time, we have uh, users engaged. And a year ahead of time, people can say, actually, from the Weather Service or FAA or whatever the heck it is, private sector included, say, we think something's wrong here or something like that. And then we're in a position to be able to make a change right away. So, and I know you've been thinking about that, and obviously extending a little bit further here, but maybe just a few more months besides the 30-day. I'm talking here, is there a way in which, for instance, the GFS, I know you guys have been doing some runs that have been not too far from real time, uh, to be able to have a version that you sort of trust the most, it's not perfect, but in which you could bring in, uh, you can invite certain users, you can make it open to everybody, because you can't do otherwise, uh, FTP-wise, but to invite certain key users you know would care about that, maybe certain regions, other folks like that, to be able to bring in a full year ahead of time. So then some of that useful, uh, or that feedback might be useful, and then you are in a position to go ahead and make quick changes before you even start to freeze it and hand it off to Becky and so on. Something like that possible also for the global model. Well. In 1997, we did an upgrade to the GFS that we tried to do quickly and on not quite enough resources. And then three months later, we had to roll it back because it was a massive disappointment, to say the least. You can actually see that fantastically in some of our scores uh, over the place. 
since then, and uh, uh, both internally on the NCO side and both internally on the side of all the different service centers, um, we we get hit, we get told over and over again that that and asked, are our retrospective runs reliable and are they representative of what you're actually going to put into operations? So it is we have been we have been told by our users to do it this way. We've been told by our users that all our we need to be absolute hundred percent clean in our retrospectives. And so so I, I've seen one of one of my favorite uh, quotes from uh, from uh, from uh, a external uh, implementation that was done uh, a few years back is yeah yeah we absolutely sure the code works it's frozen for three years but the changes we made three months ago broke it and that is something that if if we would do that internally we would basically be told to uh, to find new people to work and that that is that is how that is a fact of life and if if you as our users tell us that we should start doing business in a different way, then I'm very willing to, concern, to, to consider that. But the rigidity of our implementation process is for a big part driven by the, the very strong push from you as the users for us to be extremely rigorous with these things and to really freeze our code when we say that we freeze our code and really test everything and then some. So, if as a user group you think that's outdated, that's fine. But this is not because we always want to do it just this way. That's understandable, Hendrik. And I wonder if there are two tiers of users here. One is the one who really wants the fix. It, it's frozen, and, and that's it. And, and the, the retros are perfectly reliable for that. Versus some other users. And I suspect in some of the regions you might have those kind of users here to be able to participate earlier on. And they're willing to be flexible with you. They want something that's pretty good. Maybe Andy and or Jeff can see if I'm crazy or not here. And I, I, I don't want to have a fight with Becky because Becky is going to be really angry if there's an, uh, an unbeknownst change that uh, we try to slip by her. I guess the one thing, Peter, that I wanted to say, um, I absolutely think we can bring the public, the private sector more into this. But I'll tell you, this was before my time, but the reason we do a 30-day is because of JetBlue. We busted JetBlue. And so if you ask anybody in NCO, the reason we run and those are the JetBlue NCO parallels. So at least in that, putting that data out for the 30 days, and God, I've written a lot of TINs, and I know nobody actually reads them, but that's our attempt to pull people in. We, we encourage anyone who wants to join the model eval list and provide us feedback. We have presented feedback from public, private, private companies in the director briefings before. So we don't see it a lot, but we definitely, we would take that feedback and stuff. But that, that's at least an initial attempt to recognize that just like we can't take out AWIPS, we can't take out JetBlue. <laughs> and, and when we invite uh, folks uh, over, the private sector is invited occasionally, not often enough. But it's just like with some of the other centers. Uh, uh, with, especially with the 30-day parallels, it's very often we would like to, but we're a little bit too busy right now. So uh, if, if you want to commit to uh, reviewing them, we'll make sure that you get invites every time. Fantastic. Um, it's approaching 10 after. Uh, Avishal has one more um, question, and then uh, Sam promises he has two quick comments, and Andy wants to say something too. What? I Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the question was whether or not he was crazy. Okay. <laughs> but but not, yeah, I think you know in this environment we need to be creative, and I mean if, if there's something that's experimental, you know we understand that. And if you want to try it, you know get an early look. Yeah, I think you know just labeling and communications. I think those are great ideas. Uh, just continuing from the thought of involving others outside of the weather service, uh, for ocean forecast systems, most of our community of users is actually outside the weather service, and we try very hard to engage them, say, from U.S. Coast Guard, NOS, and others. Um, one thought I had in terms of the new uh, structure, um, we used to have dev nomads 
And that capability um, uh, was really, really helpful in terms of sharing our data, our results early on with our prospective evaluators, prospective users. And uh, they could get the data in exactly the same format as would be available from nomads, from the operational walk nomads, uh, or FTP prod for that matter. So uh, Becky, any thoughts on uh, reviving that? We, I think we talk about that with Hendrik every Friday that we meet. But yeah, I mean, there, definitely we need to come up with a way to provide the data that is secure and robust. And um, you know, that's a lot of this. As, as this moves upstream to the developers, we absolutely are going to have to give you guys the tools to get the data out there. And there's definitely some models that the slice and dice is really important. Others, people never use the slice and dice. So I think part of it is when you look at that, who uses it, how, and then come up with good ways for you as the developers to use, to provide you with ways to disseminate the data that way. Other comments from the panel? I, I just have one. I, I like to use these forums to call out people who do serve over and beyond. And since we're talking about evaluations, uh, David Myrick and the MDL group for the MDL viewers, that was a huge help with the RTMA IRMA review. Uh, it's also been a huge help with the NDM. I don't want to say it was a small effort. It was a fairly significant effort, but not a huge one in terms of our normal you know, five-year programs. They did this in half a dozen months. And that, had it, that made it much easier for the field to participate in, in the evaluation. So I just want to call out another success. Very good. OK. Uh, Sam promises two quick comments. So I wanted to bring together some comments that I've heard from various people, including some of the panel members, to show the connection. So I'm one of the HWARF developers, and I've been living through this uh, strict update, upgrade schedule for about six upgrades now, I think. And there's a few things that have been critical to it. One of you said that it's good to have the forecasters provide a list of important test cases, real world past cases. That has been absolutely critical. You may recall Hendrick's slide, which has a short time period for testing. But as Bill said, we test all year round. And the way we test is to take the small number of test cases that NHC, JTWC, others give us for the HWARF and do small scale tests to make sure that objectively and subjectively the forecasts have improved. And we do that interactively with forecasters when we have big updates that may have large impact. The agile development has been useful for this. We have every two weeks an HWARF meeting with all of their various uh, contributors all over NOAA and in universities and elsewhere. And they each have a branch or two code branches and script branches with their updates to the HWARF. We vet it based on on evidence and put it in to our main trunk development. And eventually, that's what goes to NCO. Someone suggested that we could get away with a short or even non-existent test cycle. JetBlue is not the only reason that NCO needs these tests. EMC cannot test the code like NCO tests the code. We don't have the ability to send to the actual forecasters through all of the delivery methods. We don't yet have the ability to use ECO, but we will. We can't use all of the pretty buttons and interact with the SDM. And I guarantee you, no matter how meticulous EMC is, something will go wrong, probably 10 or 20 somethings, some of which will be hard to track down. And that's what that 30-day parallel is for. Uh, 